Welcome to the last lesson in this series. This lesson is on the theory of volume change and the solution of volume change problems associated with unsaturated soils. My name is Dale Fredlin and I am Professor Emeritus at the University of Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. You may recall from lesson number two that two independent stress tensors must be taken into consideration when describing the physical behavior of an unsaturated soil. One tensor could sustain shear stresses and it was called the net normal stress tensor. The other tensor was called the matrix suction tensor or simply the suction tensor. The suction uh, tensor was isotropic in nature because it was the difference between two isotrop isotropic stresses, namely poor air pressure and poor water pressure. The stress state variables were presented in the form of a three by three matrix or a tensor. The tensor designation is important because we live in a three dimensional world. Our goal as soil mechanics practitioners is to be able to describe the physical behavior of soils in terms of state variables. The stress state variables at a point can be viewed as surface tractions on a referential elemental volume or an REV with X, Y, and Z coordinate, uh, Cartesian coordinates. The goal in this lecture is to link the stress state variables with the deformation state variables for an unsaturated soil. In so doing, it becomes possible to map changes in the relative amount of each phase of an REV. It is also important that there be a smooth transition between descriptions of physical behavior for a saturated soil and an unsaturated soil. Constitutive relations for volume change relate the deformation state variables to the stress state variables. Constitutive relations are required for saturated soils and for unsaturated soils. In addition to mapping overall volume change, it is necessary to predict relative changes in the amount of each uh, of the phases within the REV. Several forms of constitutive relations can be formulated for volume change. The soil mechanics form was um, based on historical soil mechanics volume change variables such as void ratio, degree of saturation and water content. Secondly, a compressibility form of volume change constitutive relations also originated in the early days of soil mechanics. And thirdly, an elastic form later arose out of a desire to visualize soil behavior in the same context as was used for other building materials such as concrete. And uh, of the type that was presented in strength of materials classes in our first and second year of engineering. I will try to explain that there are mathematical relations that allow uh, transitioning between the various forms of constitutive relations. Volume changes can be described in terms of the deformation of the soil structure and the relative volumes of water and air. Integration of deformation patterns throughout the continuum provide information on displacements. The justification for deformation state variables is based on the need to satisfy the conservation of mass for a multi-phase unsaturated soil system. The use of a referential elemental volume or an REV means that the element is fixed to a particular mass of soil particles. A volumetric continuity requirement must be adhered to in order to ensure that there are no so-called gaps or discontinuity between the various phases. A referential type element can be selected 
for describing the deformation fields for an unsaturated soil. The element is referential in the sense that the element of soil is, uh, is referenced to a fixed number of soil particles. When a change in the stress state is imposed, the referential element will translate and deform. The translation and deformation of an REV element uh, are used to define the longitudinal strains and the shear strains within the continuum in the same sense as we were taught in strength of materials. So we're using those definitions. The relative amounts of air and water in the pore space may change as the element deforms. These changes also need to be taken into consideration. Conservation of mass for all faces involved must be maintained at all times in the REV. This means that the sum of the volume changes with respect to each of the phases must be equal to the overall volume change of the referential element. This can be achieved by imposing a volumetric continuity requirement on the REV element. In other words, the sum of the changes in the volume of air and water in the referential element must equal be equal to the overall volume change of the REV since the soil particles are assumed to be incompressible. The volumetric continuity requirement shows that two independent constitutive relations are now required to define the volume mass constitutive behavior of an unsaturated soil. A strain tensor can be written for the overall REV element. The strain tensor is comprised of three or longitudinal strain components and six shear strain components. Only the soil solids can sustain sh shear, the shear component of deformation. The trace of the strain tensors, that is the sum of the three longitudinal strain components, yields the overall volumetric strain of the REV. The assumption is made that only longitudinal strains result in the change in volume of the REV. Volume mass constitutive relations are empirical mathematical linkages between the deformation state variables and the stress state variables. The constitutive relations always result in the incorporation of material properties. That is, they are deformation soil properties. Several forms of constitutive relations can be developed. The elasticity form is consistent with Hooke's law, where the following assumptions are made. First, normal stresses do not produce shear strains. And secondly, shear stress does not produce normal strains. It should be noted that the elasticity form of the constitutive relations is generally used in computer software codes. However, it is important to understand the relationship of the elasticity form of the constitutive equations to the other forms, for example, to the compressibility form of constitutive relations, and secondly, to the soil mechanics form of constitutive relations. As a reminder and a point of reference, let us review the form of the equation used for Hooke's law for a linear elastic behavior of a saturated soil. The soil is assumed to be isotropic and homogeneous. The longitudinal strain in each of the Cartesian coordinate directions is written in terms of changes in the stresses in all three coordinate directions. Young's modulus or capital E is the material property defining the relationship between stress and strain for each of the principal directions. Poisson's ratio or mu, the Greek symbol mu, is used to define the effects of orthogonal directional 
stress changes. The concepts associated with Hooke's law for a one-dimensional or a one a one-phase solid material and for a saturated soil can be extended to embrace the linear elastic behavior of an unsaturated soil. Since there is an additional stress state variable that can be independently changed for an unsaturated soil, there must be another soil property to define the linear elastic relationship between soil suction and longitudinal strain. This variable is designated by the capital letter H <clears throat> and is described as the modulus of elasticity for the soil structure with respect to a change in matrix suction. The longitudinal strain equations can be written for each of the three coordinate directions. It is well known that soil behavior can be nonlinear. This slide shows a modified form of Hooke's law that uses an incremental form to describe nonlinear behavior. The incremental form of Hooke's law allows for the approximation of nonlinear elastic behavior. <clears throat> Since there are two independent stress state variables that can produce volume change, the associ associated constitutive relationship becomes three-dimensional in character. One stress state variable is the net normal stress and the other is the suction stress. There can also be different stress paths associated with net normal stress changes. This slide is simply an attempt to illustrate the that the constitutive behavior for an unsaturated soil takes on the form of a three-dimensional surface. However, it is difficult to clearly portray the three-dimensional surface using a two-dimensional um, graphics. The volumetric continuity requirement showed us that a second constitutive relationship was required in order to quantify changes <clears throat> in relative percentages of air and water in the voids of the soil. In other words, another independent constitutive relationship is needed. The constitutive relationship could be for either the air phase or the water phase. The volumetric uh, continuity requirement can then be used to calculate uh, other volume mass relations. The water phase constitutive relationship is selected to show the form of the second constitutive relationship. This relationship is also three-dimensional in character and uses the same two independent stress variables along the uh, abscissa axis. It should be noted that the arithmetic subtraction of the water phase constitutive relationship from the soil structure constitutive relationship will yield the air phase constitutive relationship. The net normal stress shown on the previous graph can follow a number of different stress paths. Stress paths that have been used for saturated soil studies can also now be used for unsaturated soil studies. This slide makes reference to the following stress paths. First, number one, a three-dimensional loading path. Number two, an isotropic stress path. And number three, a uniaxial stress path. There are assumptions associated with the following, with following each of the three a stress paths mentioned. If the assumptions are applied to Hooke's e law equation for a linear elastic material, it is possible to calculate the relationship between the elastic soil properties for each type of loading. In other words, a variety of laboratory test procedures could theoretically be followed to calculate the linear elastic properties. It should be noted that in each case, 
there may also be an unloading stress path in addition to the loading stress paths. Two further forms of loading of soil are shown on this slide, namely the fourth in the series here is the triaxial or actually the biaxial loading stress path. And the fifth pathway is the K naught or the one dimensional loading. Once again, the elastic parameters corresponding to the Hooke's linear elastic equation can be calculated. The con conversion of measured unsaturated soil properties to Hooke's linear elastic properties are illustrated for the case of isotropic loading of a soil. For isotropic loading, all three longitudinal strains are added together to get the volumetric strain. Adding these three equations results in an equation that relates the bulk modulus of the soil to the elastic soil pr uh, properties. The addition of the three equations shows that the bulk modulus is equal to Young's modulus divided by three times one minus mu times the Poisson's ratio. The conversion of measured unsaturated soil properties to Hooke's linear elastic uh, parameters is also illustrated for the case of K naught loading of the soil. K naught or one dimensional loading of the soil is quite common in soil mechanics laboratories. For isotropic loading, the strain in two horizontal directions must be set to zero. Under these boundary conditions, the addition of, the, of Hooke's law equations in the three directions yields a relationship between volumetric strain and Young's modulus for an assumed Poisson's ratio of the soil. It is important to understand that the relationships between measured soil properties and properties that are most likely to be used in the computer um, software. Most computer codes are coded to accept linear elastic soil properties, either overall or on an incremental basis. Since the early days of soil mechanics, our founding pioneers also proposed compressibility type forms for stress deformation relations. Therefore, it is a value to examine the relationship between compressibility type soil parameters and the linear elastic designations of soil properties. In saturated soils, the coefficient of volume change was defined as the relationship between volumetric strain and a change in effective stress. The compressibility form for an unsaturated soil must be expanded now to brace, embrace two compressibility moduli. One for the net normal stress changes and designated as M1S and another one for matrix suction changes designated as M2S. This figure shows a variety of relations between soil compressibility properties for an unsaturated soil and the linear elastic properties. The soil property relations are shown for isotropic loading and for K naught loading. The elasticity form of equations has two soil properties and most test procedures used in soil mechanics laboratories yield one variable. To get around this problem, a typical Poisson's ratio is often assumed and then an equivalent elastic Young's modulus is calculated. There are also soil mechanics terminologies that have been used since the inception of so the soil mechanics discipline. For example, volume changes were described in terms of void ratio changes and the soil property relating void ratio changes to effective stress changes was termed the coefficient of compressibility or A sub V. 
The soil mechanics terminology can now be extended to embrace unsaturated soil behavior. For unsaturated soils, there needs to be a coefficient of compressibility with respect to the net normal stress variable, A sub T1, and another coefficient of compressibility with respect to matrix suction changes, given the symbol A sub M. The constitutive surfaces can be plotted using historic soil mechanics terminology. Void ratio is used to define volume changes for net normal stress changes and matrix suction changes. The constitutive surfaces have similar forms to those previously shown for volumetric strain. If the three-dimensional constitutive surfaces, uh, surface is un is folded onto a two-dimensional plot, the void ratio changes produced by changing each of the stress variables can be compared. The comparison shows that as the magnitude of the stress variable is increased, an application of the net normal stress is becomes more effective in producing void ratio changes than does the production of increasing the matrix suction of the soil. A similar comparison can be made by examining the water content constitutive surface plotted using soil mechanics terminology. The three-dimensional constitutive surface can once again be folded onto a two-dimensional comparison. The comparison shows that as the magnitude of the stress variable is increased, an application of the net normal stress is less effective in producing water content changes than are produced by the matrix suction changes. A further comparison can be made by placing the void ratio changes and the water content changes onto a common ordinate scale. The comparison shows that when a soil starts at saturated conditions, there will be a three-way separation in the constitutive behavior as stress state variables are increased. Net total stress increases produce the largest void ratio changes, while matrix suction changes will produce the greatest water content changes. I think that enough detail has been given on the theoretical relationships between measured soil property, unsaturated soil properties. It should now be clear that volume change engineering problems are more complex than those of for a saturated soil. Also, the analysis of volume change problems are more difficult than shear strength problems and seepage type uh, engineering problems. Let us look briefly at the application of volume change theory to real world problems. The derivation of a partial differential equation or PDA to solve stress deformation problems starts with satisfying the conservation of linear and angular momentum. Constitutive equations are then substituted into the force equilibrium equations. The PDEs for a saturated unsaturated soil system can then be solved using a numerical method such as the finite element method. Soil properties associated with the constitutive models discussed thus far must be converted into elastic and plastic parameters acceptable to the numerical model models being used. This slide shows the force equilibrium equations in the three Cartesian coordinate directions. These equations form the starting point for stress deformation analyses. A variety of stress strain constitutive models could be inserted into the force equilibrium equation. These Models fall into the broad categories of elastic models and elastoplastic models. The resulting partial differential equations can be solved for displacements resulting 
from various applied loading conditions. Boundary conditions, that is in terms of force or displacement, must also be applied to the boundary nodes of the finite element mesh. It is, it is outside the scope of this presentation to provide further details on solving force displacement type problems. Rather, a couple of examples involving volume change will be presented. An unsaturated soil can undergo volume change either as a result of a change in net normal stress or soil suction. An unsaturated soil may experience either a volume increase or a volume decrease as a result of a decrease in matrix suction. Volume decrease problems are referred to as soil collapse uh, problems. A common problem encountered in engineering practice involves the prediction of potential heave of light engineering structures placed on expansive soils. Squel swelling clay problems may require either a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional analysis. As suction is decreased, the soil swells or increases in volume. Let us follow the complex stress path that would be uh, followed in the field by an expansive soil subjected to a matrix suction change. Let us follow what happens on the void ratio constitutive surface. Although the soil may have been sedimented as a lacustrian in, in a lacustrian environment, it has subsequently been subjected to numerous cycles of drying and wetting. Each drying and wetting cycle induces desiccation in the soil and may involve a hysteresis loop. Consequently, it is difficult to determine the stress history of a soil at the time of sampling that soil. In any case, the sample soil has been subjected to a very complex stress history imposed by the environment. The stress path followed during the sampling of the soil can be visualized on a three-dimensional plot that shows the changes in the stress state variables. Sampling reduces the total stress state of the sample. However, the matrix suction in the soil is increased by a certain amount. The assumption is made that that the swelling plane defined by unloading the soil is mon monotonic. In other words, the plane is assumed to be unique and not hysteretic. If this is correct, it can be assumed that the swelling pressure of a soil can be assumed to represent the in situ stress rate transferred onto the total stress plane. It is known, however, that soil sampling does affect the stress state of the soil. When the soil is subjected to a stress reversal, which is what happens during sampling, the subsequently measured swelling pressure is reduced from its original in situ value. This is particularly true when an attempt is made to measure the swelling pressure using either the constant volume test methodology or the free swell test metho methodology. Therefore, it was suggested by Fredlin in 1980 that a correction be applied if the swelling pressure is measured using the constant volume test procedure. The correction applies applied to the measured swelling pressure is illustrated in this figure. The empirical procedure is essentially the same as that suggested by Casagrande when measuring the preconsolidation pressure of a saturated soil. The corrected swelling pressure represents the in situ total stress state plus the matrix suction of the soil transferred onto the total stress plane. Other test procedures have been proposed for measuring the swelling properties of a soil. 
A free swell type test procedure is also commonly performed and it generally provides a somewhat higher magnitude for the swelling pressure. The slope of the rebound or swelling curve constitutes a second soil property that is required for the prediction of heave of a swelling soil. The slope of the swelling curve can be approximated as the straight line on a semi-log plot of total stress versus void ratio. This constitutes the soil's information needed to calculate the amount of heave that might occur in if a soil becomes wetted and matrix suction goes to zero. The equation for the slope of a straight line on a semi-log plot is shown on this slide. The equation needs to be solved for the prediction of one-dimensional heave. Interesting, this is, interestingly, this is the same form of equation that is commonly used to calculate consolidation settlement of a soft, normally consolidated clay soil. An expansive soil stratum can be divided into layers and the changes in void ratio associated with swelling, the swelling process in each layer can be solved and then summed to obtain total heave. In addition to knowing the swelling index of a soil, it is also necessary to be able to establish initial and final stress dates for each layer of soil. The initial stress date on the total stress plane is the corrected swelling pressure of the soil. The swelling pressure is assumed to be equal to the net overburden pressure in the field plus the matrix suction transferred onto the total stress plane. Therefore, the matrix suction component is referred to as a matrix suction equivalent. The final stress state within the soil layer of an expansive soil can be written as the original total stress plus or minus any changes that may have been do, occurred due to excavation or placement of additional soil. It is also possible to assume that the final pore water pressure under equilibrium conditions could be negative or positive as shown in this figure. Let us consider one example calculation for the prediction of heave in an expansive soil. Three swell pressure tests were performed on the labor in the laboratory and the swelling pressure decrease from 800 kilopascals near the ground surface to 300 kilopascals at depth. The swelling index was measured to be 0.21, and the final pore water pressure was assumed to be uh, um, seven kilopascals. The expansive soil strata was subdivided into three layers. Using the above suggested equations for heave, a one-dimensional analysis predicted a total heave of 221 millimeters. The analysis for the prediction of heave is often more complex than just described. In reality, there are generally two physical processes involved when dealing with an expansive soil. The amount of water, for example, can be it, it, the movement of water can be either in one dimension, two dimension, or three dimension. The stress deformation analysis can either be a one dimensional analysis or a two dimensional or a three dimensional. Movement of water is usually from the ground surface. Downward movement of moisture comes from rainfall or snow melt. And the upward movement of moisture is associated with evaporation and evapotranspiration. Time is required for moisture movement. And as a result, the swelling of a soil is a transient problem. And it is continuously, in other words, it's continuously changing the stress date conditions. 
Let us briefly consider a case history involving swelling clay in the city of Regina, Canada. The building was a small factory with a concrete slab placed at ground surface. A hot water line was placed below the concrete slab. After almost one year, a substantial crack appeared near the mid point of the slab. During the construction of the building, soil samples had been taken and instrumentation had been installed below the slab. Unfortunately, there was a break in the hot water line, which resulted in considerable amount of water being released into the underlying swelling soil. Consequently, it was possible to undertake a back analysis as a case history. Complete details of the case history can be found in the textbook titled Unsaturated Soil Mechanics in Engineering Practice published in uh, 2012. The swelling pressure in the, for the case history we're talking about of the original soil sample was measured using the constant volume methodology. The uncorrected and corrected swelling pressures were plotted versus depth. The swelling pressures ranged from near zero at 2.2 meters to over 600 kilopascals at 0.7 meters. The swelling pressures can be seen to be substantially larger than the overburden pressures. Further details regarding the two-dimensional geometry and boundary conditions are shown in this figure. The first task was to establish the boundary conditions for the seepage analysis. The seepage analysis is transient in nature and therefore initial conditions needed to first be established. Water usage records established the surface flux um, of water entering the soil. Infiltration could be modeled over time. The changes in water content were then Im imported into a two-dimensional stress strain model, which allowed for the computation of vertical stress as a function of elapsed time of infiltration. Final vertical displacements were compared to measured displacements for the vertical section below the center of the slab. A comparison of the calculated and measured vertical heave was made across the slide, slab with the cross section going through the point of maximum movement. Ground movement plates allowed for the measurement of heave at various depths. The maximum measured heave was about 75 millimeters. The measured Final vertical displacements of the, uh, of the surface of the concrete slab are plotted as a dashed line on this uh, slide. Contours of the calculated heave of the concrete slab are also plotted versus elapsed time. The effect of the assumed final boundary condition is also shown. The steady state seepage contours correspond to the amount of water lost into the expansive soil under steady state seepage. There is close agreement between the measured and calculated concrete slab movements. Vertical heave contours could also be plotted versus depth for the selected cross section across the slab. The contours correspond to steady state seepage conditions. This case history has been presented with a limited number of possible graphs that could be plotted. It is uh, possible to analyze many possible scenarios, providing the geotechnical engineer with a much more complete picture of uh, the behavior of light structures placed on expansive soils. I would like to conclude this lecture with the pictorials showing my view of the world of soil mechanics. Of course, I have a bias. And the bias shows in the depiction of soil mechanics. I have placed a phreatic line through the middle of the world, 
laying claim to no more than 50% of the world of unsaturated soil mechanics. I'm claiming it for unsaturated soil mechanics. However, in all seriousness, what I want to illustrate is in as simple a form as possible is the way in which unsaturated soil mechanics can be viewed as a simple extension of saturated soil mechanics. The simple concept that I wish to convey is that total stresses and soil suction form two independent stress state variables that set the stage for the development of constitutive relations that are consistent with the forms that have been become familiar for usage in saturated soil mechanics. I hope that you have found this series of lessons to be informative. This concludes the lesson series on unsaturated soil mechanics. Thanks for listening. And I trust that you have found these lessons to be a good starting point for a more in-depth study for the application of unsaturated soil mechanics into engineering practice.